Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Well, good morning. Good to see all of you here. Appreciate you being here on, I guess, what is a holiday weekend. And uh, I've got... uh, I hope you've had a great time with the 4th and all the great summer activities going on. Uh, I'm Pastor Kelly, and we're in a sermon series called Old Rules for a New Life. We're specifically looking at the Ten Commandments. And today we get to the Seventh Commandment. Let's read this verse out loud together. It's on the screen. You must not commit adultery. And there's a principle, there's, there's a premise at the heart of this command. And it is that we were created for faithfulness. We were created for faithfulness. And we know that because we're created in the image and likeness of God. Uh, Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. And so we don't commit adultery because God is not an adulterous God. Uh, Faithfulness is part of God's character. And faithfulness is part of God's design, desire, and intent for us. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied, they record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. And so Jesus goes all the way back to Genesis, back to God's original model, original pattern for marriage to reemphasize that faithfulness is God's design, desire, and intent for us. So faithfulness is the principle. Faithfulness is the premise. And I've often taught you that with, in the Bible, with biblical principles, there's a premise and a promise. The premise comes with a promise. Well, this premise comes with a problem, a problem, in that we have been created for faithfulness, but we are tempted toward betrayal. We're tempted toward betrayal. We have an enemy who betrayed God, the devil. He's a betrayer. And he loves to tempt us to betray God, to betray our spouse. He loves to destroy God's model, God's design for us. He loves to destroy marriages, destroy families, destroy churches. And he works diligently constantly at it. You need to understand that your marriage, your family is constantly under attack. And that's why we so desperately need to follow this commandment. And it's, it's a very simple command. It's five words. You must not commit adultery. And it's very clear, but it does raise some questions. And the first question is, is what is adultery? If I'm not supposed to commit it, well, what is it? So here's the definition. Adultery is having a physically intimate relationship with someone who is not your spouse. Now, if you find yourself trying to determine if your actions have crossed the line into physical intimacy or not, Hmm, I wonder, does this activity fall into that category or not? I did this, but I didn't do this, so maybe it's okay. And if you're even asking those kind of questions to excuse a behavior, if you're trying to parse out the definition, you just need to cry uncle and admit you've crossed the line. Okay? And later, I'm going to tell you how to deal with this if you've crossed the line. Because God knows that we're tempted to betrayal, and he has made provision for us. Now, a second question is, is why is adultery prohibited? Which I think is a legitimate question, but at the same time, it's a bit of an odd question. Because why would God not prohibit adultery? 
Why would God not prohibit something that causes so much damage and pain to people? Something that is so blatantly against his character, so blatantly against his design for us. Because God created physical intimacy to be a wonderful, joyful experience that creates a powerful bond between two people. It takes two people and makes them into one. And physical intimacy needs an environment that is just as powerful, an environment that will protect it and sustain it. And that environment is a marriage between a man and a woman. So why is adultery prohibited? Well, adultery is prohibited because physical intimacy is sacred and it deserves a sacred space, a marriage. Uh, Let's read Hebrews 13.4. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. So marriage is not something to be taken lightly. It's to be honored. It's to be kept pure. And if it isn't, you risk God's judgment. Now, because God is patient and gracious, to us, he can seem slow to act. And we can think we're getting by with stuff. But the Bible is clear that there is a reckoning, there is a judgment coming. And even as a believer in Jesus Christ, you don't want to be on the wrong side of that. Because God disciplines his children because he loves them. And so there are consequences to our actions. In the wedding vows, we say, forsaking all others as long as we both shall live. Forsaking all others. It means to renounce and give up all other romantic or emotional attachments or connections, and you dedicate yourself solely to your spouse. Can't be looking around anymore. There comes a point where you decide, I am a one-woman man and she's the woman. I am a one-man woman and he's the man. Uh, We told our kids uh, when they were growing up, we told them to wait to date until they were ready to get married. And I know it's radical, it's a radical concept to tell teenagers uh, not to date. But we didn't want them to give their heart away uh, until they were mature enough to do it. Don't, don't give your heart away until you're really ready to give it away. Guard your heart, save it, protect it for your spouse. That way, when you're ready to give your heart to your spouse, you can give them your whole heart. You give them a healthy heart, not some broken, wounded, beat-up heart because of all these crushes and uh, you know, dating a string of different people. Just wait. Just wait until you're old enough and ready to get married and then look around. I told my sons, look around for a godly woman. I told my daughter, look around for a godly man. Pick one out and then spend the rest of your life focused on that person. Keep your heart, mind, body, passions, desires, eyes focused on that one person. Don't be looking around at anybody else forsaking all others because your marriage is sacred and it's to be honored and kept pure. Now, adultery is prohibited because our bodies matter. Your your body is not just made of matter. Your body matters. In 1 Corinthians 6, Uh, Paul is writing to a a Christian community who, much like us, are trying to follow Jesus in an over-sexualized culture. But the Corinthians were trying to rationalize their immoral behavior. So Paul quotes their argument back to them. Uh, I have the right to do anything, you say. I have the right to do anything. But Paul says, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will be mastered by, will not be mastered by anything. And so, in other words, I'm going to keep my body under control. Self-control is a spiritual discipline. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. 
And it doesn't mean the self in control, it means the self under control. The Corinthians. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food and God will destroy them both. Now their argument was, when I'm hungry, I eat. If I have physical urges, why not satisfy them? Because someday God's going to destroy this body and the urges. So what does it matter what I do with my body? And Paul uh, attacks that reductionist view of the body. The body that says, well, when I have desires, it's okay to meet those desires because the body really doesn't matter. And Paul says, no, 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 no. There's something much more to your body. This body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, it wasn't a spiritual resurrection. He did not come back as a spirit. He came back with a real physical body. And one day, your body will be raised with Christ. God's plan is not to destroy your body. God's plan is to glorify your body. Your body is part of Christ himself. Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. And Paul's addressing a common occurrence that happened in the city of Corinth in which someone would be with a prostitute as a religious practice. The, the pagan temples there ran brothels as a means of fundraising. They didn't have bazaars and bake sales. They ran a brothel, okay? And because they didn't value the body or marriage the way God values the body and marriage. Pagan religions, false religions, are run by the devil. And the devil is a destroyer. He destroys bodies, he destroys marriages, he destroys families. So Paul is teaching the Corinthians, he's teaching us a new way of looking at the body and seeing the marriage relationship as God sees it. Uh, our bodies will be raised like Jesus Christ. Our bodies are part of Christ's body. The marriage relationship is a picture of that relationship. That's why marriage is sacred and important it, because it's not just about you. It's not just about your spouse. It's about Christ and the church. And Paul's correction for the situation is, he says, flee from sexual immorality. Flee from it. The Greek word there is the word fugete. And uh, think of our English word fugitive. Okay? Fleeing, running away from, escaping from, breaking free from sexual immorality. And the word for sexual immorality is the word porneia. That's where we get the word porn. And sexual immorality is any sexual activity other than that between a husband and wife in a marriage. So flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you've received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And so as Christians, as members of the body of Christ, we're to have a high, glorious, beautiful perspective on our bodies. They are a valued temple in which the Holy Spirit resides. Now, yes, someday, someday this body will die. But just like Jesus Christ, it will be resurrected in glory. Uh, folks, this body of mine is wearing out. 
and I have a new body on order. I just don't know the delivery date, okay? But, but Paul teaches us that physical intimacy, it's not just a moment of physical pleasure. It's a sacred spiritual experience that needs to be honored and protected in a marriage. It needs to be kept pure. And if it's not, God will judge us. We, we don't get to skate by on this. So your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. In in Old Testament theology, the temple was a physical place where God's presence and power were revealed to his people. When you went to the temple, you met God in a holy place. And the temple itself was constructed to reflect God's throne room in heaven. The temple was a place where, where heaven spilled over onto earth. And Jesus left heaven, came to earth, died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and then he sent the Holy Spirit to live in us. He didn't send the Holy Spirit back to be in the temple. He sent it. We became the temples of God. There's no need for a temple in Jerusalem anymore because this body, your body, we are the temple. And in your body, there is an overlap. There is a collision of heaven and earth. There's a collision of the divine and the physical right here. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. God loves you, which means God loves your body. You're not someone with a body. You are a body. And what you do with it and to it and in it matters to God because your body has value to him. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. So do you treat your temple, do you treat your body as a temple of God? Not just how you behave sexually, but by the way you use your hands to serve people, by the way you use your tongue to speak to people, by where you let your feet take you, what you let your eyes look at, what you let uh, come into your mind. Your whole self, your body, soul, and spirit matters to God. Honor God with your body. Now, adultery is prohibited also because it threatens the faithfulness that God desires for us. Faithfulness with him, faithfulness with our spouse. So your body is a temple, your marriage is sacred, they both need to be protected and valued. Uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 5, he says, as the scriptures say, and he goes back to the same foundational passage that Jesus used. He says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. He said, this is a great mystery. Amen to that. But it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Your marriage is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Your marriage is a sign to the world about how God loves his people. Now, the reality is, it's very possible to obey this command and still have a messy marriage. Because faithfulness isn't just staying out of someone else's bed, it's about loving the bed you're in. Do you love the bed you're in? And some of you have been able to rescue and restore a marriage that's been fractured by betrayal. And that is a beautiful, beautiful picture of God's redemption and grace. I mean, it's just wonderful when that happens. Others of you have gone through a betrayal and had to get divorced over it. And that's a painful, painful thing. And God sees your pain. He feels your pain. God is close to the brokenhearted. Others of you, right now, you stand on the brink of adultery. You're on the brink. Look at your text. Look at your emotional and physical encounters with other people. Look at the rationalization and excuses you're making for your behavior. 
And this is a moment, this is a moment for you to step back from that ledge. This is an opportunity for you to recognize the attack that the destroyer is unleashing on your marriage. The devil is the deceiver and the destroyer. Jesus Christ is the redeemer and restorer. And you need to flee the devil and run to Jesus Christ. Now given the pain and destruction that adultery brings, why are we tempted to commit adultery? Well, we're tempted when we haven't dealt with our differences. You must identify the differences in your marriage in a mature, healthy, desiring to grow conversation. You have to identify, you have to name, this is what I need to change. This is what I need to work on. This is what I need to stop doing. This is what I need to start doing. If you don't work through your differences, you will act out with adultery. If you don't work through your differences, Satan will deceive you into thinking that your spouse is the enemy and that you will be better off with someone else. But your spouse isn't your enemy. Satan is. And adultery is not the answer. Faithfulness is. And so you want to find a space, find some people, find a counselor, find a way to identify your differences and work through them. Marriage is just the hard work of give and take about your differences. It's not a matter of who's right and who's wrong. It's a matter of growing and changing and deferring and compromising and becoming who you need to be in Christ in order to make your marriage work. Now we're also tempted to commit adultery because we construct an idealized vision of love, sex, and marriage. We, we have this, the, this fairy tale, idealized vision of living happily ever after. Happily ever after is not an option. In the marriage vows, we say for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Right in the marriage vows, we recognize that half the time we will be miserable, okay? I mean, everybody loves better, richer, and healthy, but also comes worse, poorer, and sick, okay? And so, you know, we think if I can just marry Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright, if I can just find the one, then everything will be rosy. There won't be any hiccups or speed bumps. And then we're married for a while, and we think, what happened? The, you're not who I thought you were going to be. This is not the person I said I do to. And I love the words of Stanley Hauerwas. He's a Christian theologian. Look at this. He says, a destructive assumption is that marriage and the family are institutions of personal fulfillment, necessary for us to become happy. The assumption is that there is someone just right for us to marry, and if we look closely enough, we will find the right person. This assumption fails to appreciate the fact that we always marry the wrong person. We never know whom we marry. We just think we do. And even if we marry the right person, just give it a while and he or she will change. The person you marry will change. The great challenge of marriage is learning to love the stranger that you married. My wife Katie and I have been married for 50 years, May 10th. And believe me, okay, that's okay, hold your applause. Hold your applause, it ain't over yet, okay? <laughs> and believe me, uh, Katie has been married to several different versions of Kelly. 
There was student Kelly, businessman Kelly, church planter Kelly, pastor Kelly, husband Kelly, dad Kelly, grandpa Kelly. There's in-debt Kelly, debt-free Kelly, thanks to Dave Ramsey. There is midlife Kelly, manopause Kelly. I mean, I, I've been through a lot of versions. It's like Malibu Barbie and chicken farmer Barbie, okay? <laughs> And Katie and I have had to work through all of those versions. It's like disco music and punk rock. Sometimes you just have to live through it, okay? <laughs> so you learn to love the person you're with whatever stage of life they are in. And you gotta be willing to humbly change and adapt, to learn, grow, break bad habits, start good ones. And you, you release the idealized dream that marriage is going to make me happy. And you embrace that God's goal for marriage is to make you holy. Okay? Marriage is designed to knock the rough edges off of you so that you begin to look less like yourself and more and more like Jesus Christ. The truth is, holy is better than happy. It is. It is. And the devil doesn't want you to know that. So he deceives you into pursuing happy over holy. And as a result, you wind up unholy and unhappy. But if you pursue holiness in your marriage, you can grow into a deep, abiding joy no matter what comes your way. Now, why does, how does adultery develop? What are the stages? Step one is accepting sinful thoughts into my mind. Regardless of what the temptation is, the, the battle begins in your mind. Uh, James 1.14, temptation is the pull of a person's own thoughts, evil thoughts and wishes. These evil thoughts lead to evil actions and afterwards to death. You become what you think about. And if you think positive, good, loving, kind thoughts, that's the way you will act toward your spouse. But if you fill your mind up with lustful, dirty, trashy, obscene thoughts, that's the kind of person you will become. It's impossible not to be affected by what you let into your mind. And we have garbage disposals in our kitchens, but we have garbage dispensers in our pockets, on our desk, and in our living rooms. Our phones, computers, TVs pump filth into our minds. And you have got to guard your mind against that. 2 Timothy 2 says, turn your back on lustful desires and give your positive attention to goodness, integrity, love, and peace. So as a Christian, what do I do with these thoughts, these fantasies that, that come into my mind? Do I deny them? Do I repress them? Well, Scripture tells us to redirect them. You redirect, I turn that energy into my marriage. I think positively about my spouse. And let me just give you a good exercise to do. I'd encourage you this week, just make a list of 100 things that you like, appreciate, or love about your spouse. And it may take you some time, it may take you a couple of days to, to just work through this project and write down 100 things you appreciate about them. And then just review that list, maybe every day. It will turn your thoughts toward the positive about your spouse. Second, step two, emotional, non-physical involvement. Okay, it's not physical, it's an emotional involvement. You are looking to someone of the opposite sex, someone other than your spouse, for emotional support, for understanding, maybe even for laughter and enjoyment. And you're heading into dangerous territory. You've got to recognize the thin ice you're standing on. 
Because that kind of emotional involvement, it's unwise, it's inappropriate, it divides your affections, and it leads to the next step in the trap. And that's physical involvement. And once you've crossed the line to physical contact, it, it, to break out of a relationship that has crossed that line, it's going to take every ounce of self-control. It's going to take a tremendous amount of the grace of God for you to break free from that. It is extremely difficult. And that's why these boundaries are established in marriage. So we don't cross that line. God gave these commandments for your protection. Step four is rationalizing the affair. We are experts at telling ourselves rational lies. We, you can convince yourself that anything is okay. You find yourself going through all these mental gymnastics. You lie to yourself, you lie to your spouse, you lie to your friends, you lie to God. You are trying desperately to justify your actions and cover your tracks. And the devil is a deceiver and the devil is a liar and you now find yourself following in his footsteps. And you have destroyed the faithfulness that God made you for. What's the remedy for adultery? And remarkably, remarkably, if you've been unfaithful to your mate, there is still hope. You can come to Jesus Christ for cleansing and for healing. Adultery does not have to kill a marriage. It's like a ship. You pull it into dry dock, you refit it, you repair it, you retrain the crew, and it becomes seaworthy again. But it takes serious work and effort to get there. And it starts when you acknowledge the sin. You stop rationalizing, excusing. You call it what it is. It's sin. This is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. God has set his standard on this, and it hasn't changed. God doesn't compromise on sexual immorality. But he does indeed offer forgiveness for it. He does indeed. I think the most powerful verse in the Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That verse offers you forgiveness for your sins and it offers you everlasting life. I think the second most powerful verse in the Bible is 1 John 1.9. Because it, it deals with how do we live. It's not about eternal life. It's about how do we live this life. How do we live here with these temptations and our shortcomings? It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That verse has every, every theme we've talked about today. Faithfulness, God's judgment, forgiveness, and purity. And you just, you just lay it all out there. Just, God, I've not controlled my thought life. I have not guarded my heart. I misused and abused my body. I have violated my marriage vows. I have dug myself into a deep, deep hole. God, I need you to rescue me. And when you cry out to God, he will rescue you. He'll rescue you. You know how God judges us for, for adultery? He just lets our actions play out. He doesn't have to strike us with lightning or open up the ground and swallow us up. He just lets our actions play out. We just suffer the consequences. That's the greatest judgment. But God offers us a way out from that. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just, he will pull us up out of that miry pit now, you'll come up out of there pretty skinned up and awfully messy. But God promises to clean you up, bind up your wounds, and set your feet on the right path. God wants to keep you on the right path. And it starts with confessing the sin. And then you've got to end the relationship immediately and completely. You move into adultery slowly. You move out of it quickly. 
quickly, act immediately without delay. The Bible says today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. You make a quick and complete break. No more letters, cards, chats, texts, emails. No meetings to explain it or say goodbye. If they call, you don't answer. You just do whatever it takes to avoid the situation. And if it means changing jobs, if it means changing neighborhoods, if it means changing churches, you do it. Whatever it takes to break the relationship. Now, God created physical intimacy to be a wonderful, fantastic, beautiful expression of Christ's love for the church. But used improperly, it destroys marriages and damages families. It creates misery, guilt, shame, regret, depression. So God established these rules for your benefit because God's way is the best way. So do not commit adultery, flee from sexual immorality, confess your sins. You can stay on track and you can get back on track. That's the hope that Jesus Christ offers you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that when we are faithless, you remain faithful. And God, give, help us, give us enough courage and humility to confess our sins, to set aside our selfish desires and to work toward healthy and holy marriages. And we come to you with hurts and wounds. And as we come, may we find the healing, forgiveness, and new life that you offer us as we trust in Jesus Christ and follow your rules. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook Church. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.